Hello and welcome to the Society with Fatma Shaheen at PTV World. Educational reforms, as we all understand, have been happening in Pakistan, not only now, but for quite some time. In this regard, when we talk about the very pressing need of educational reform, it's very important to talk then that, you know, uh, how has uh, the curriculum in the education system that evolved over a period of time? And this is exactly what we'll be talking about in our today's show. Alongside that, we'll also be talking about, you know, the concept of teacher development, how that has changed. We'll be talking about the relationship between students and teachers per se. We'll be talking about the access to education in this regard, of course, and the discussion of Article 25A of the Pakistani Constitution. That becomes very relevant. And that is exactly what we'll be doing during the course of today's conversation. In this regard, it's also very pertinent to mention at the outset that, you know, statistics suggest the fact that, you know, the enrollment rate in educational institutions has increased in Pakistan per se. But, you know, this again raises a very important question, which then is that, you know, is this directly proportional to also, of course, you know, improving the quality of education, which is being imparted in the education institutions per se. That is also something that we'll be touching upon during the course of today's conversation. And last but not the least, when we talk about improving Pakistan's education system, what are the areas that we need to work on? What are the issues of concern and what is the way forward? That is also something which, of course, we'll be talking about and during the today's conversation. This and much more to follow on today's show and to do that let me introduce you to my today's panel and my first panelist for the show today is professor abed sharwani saab who's a senior educationist assalam alaikum ji welcome Thank to the show Islam. Thank you much. my second panelist for the show today is miss sahar atif she's also an educationist assalam alaikum ji welcome to the show assalam alaikum fatma and my third panelist for the show today is Mr. Hamid Saeed Saab, who is an expert on, you know, personal styling. And of course, he's also a renowned image uh, consultant. Assalamu alaikum, sir, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, to get the conversation started with you, Abid Saab, I think uh, to start from the very basics, uh, you basically stepped into the education sector back in the 90s, 80s. So from the 1980s to year 2022, how do you see Pakistan's education system evolving over a period of time, more so in terms of, you know, curriculum development, more so in terms of, of course, teachers' development, and then, of course, you know, the changing dynamics of, of course, you know, the very pivotal and very important student-teacher relationship. The education system in Pakistan mm. uh, is uh, not new in Pakistan, basically. Mm. It was established mm. uh, for many decades right. uh, in era of Mughals. Mm. Uh, I read a book mm. that in 18... 95 hmm. the literacy rate in Punjab was more than 85 percent right in, because at that time hmm. our s education system did not on the consist of the colleges or schools or universities hmm. they consist of the madrasas right and the mosque level schools as well right but uh, at that time uh, our literacy rate was quite well hmm. and after the subcontinent when and captured by our English people hmm. and they introduced different reforms hmm. in all walks of life right. in education particularly hmm. and they set up the current system right, that is based on schools, colleges and universities. Right, well. sir. Sir, I would want you to, you know, further elaborate about the curriculum per se, how that has evolved over a period of time, how, of course, the way we teach yeah. students, that has changed. And then, of course, the very, I think, ever evolving, rather the very dynamic student-teacher relationship as it does stand today. Yeah. When I was started my career in 1989, uh, uh, the way of teaching mm. was quite different from day to day. Mm. Uh, because at that time, there is no technology, hmm. there is no competition, hmm. and there is one-way communication system between right. teachers and students as well. Hmm. But now that system has been completely changed now. Hmm. Now a lot of technology has been introduced in all walks of life, in hmm. at students' life as well, the teaching life as well. Hmm. So both are using this technology and we cannot live without that technology hmm. as well. And uh, that is bring a lot of changes in in the knowledge and intellect level of both sides right and so of course i think that has also brought a very fundamental change in the way children are taught per se too yes. and of course we saw this in the covid 19 pandemic as well whereas of course it has had a very positive effect in the sense that it has still you know in the pandemic when everything was closed down it still allowed students to actually access education at least to those who could actually you know access technology yeah. it yeah. of course had a negative impact as well madam i'll come to you i think we must also talk about of course the very interesting subject 
subjects that you are teaching at a private university mm -hmm. in Pakistan, mm -hmm. uh, one being fashion management, the other being basically entrepreneurship. And mm -hmm. these are, of course, I understand very unique kind of subjects mm -hmm. because when you look mm -hmm. at, you know, a conventional degree, I, I don't think that these are the subjects mm -hmm. which are, you know, typically offered to any student mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. So number one, what made you actually, you know, opt to teach such subjects per se? And why do you feel it's so important for the students today to actually learn these skills? I started my education at the Pakistan Institute of Fashion and Design in 1994. Hmm. And that was uh, at the time when the government recognized that hmm. fashion is not something we can overlook. Pakistan was uh, leading in textiles hmm. and fashion was the value added. Hmm. And uh, from there to here, the journey has been uh, constantly evolving. Hmm. Now we come to recognizing that these are not just design subjects, hmm. these are business subjects right. too. Because Espe from Especially the entrepreneurship one, madam. Under the umbrella of entrepreneurship, right. we would sort of put in the fashion management also. Hmm. So world over, entrepreneurship is a very um, sort of recognized subject in Pakistan. Pakistanis innately hmm. are a very entrepreneurial nation. Right. So young students, when you come into a classroom, they will usually come into my classroom hmm. with existing businesses, hmm. startups, and they are uh, running very, very successfully. So right. talking about the digitization hmm. that has taken hmm. place, it has empowered students, women, people who did not have access to the consumer and the direct market through social media. Right. We they have now become digital entrepreneurs. But madam, I think another way to of course look at it is taking from where you left that I think entrepreneurship and having that skill, I think that is very fundamental for anybody, not only necessarily for those who want to actually end up having their own businesses. Because I think it gives you that, you know, perhaps that kind of perspective to think more logically and to be more analytical mm -hmm. per se. So coming to you, I understand the fact that, you know, you have a very interesting profile. You are of course an image consultant and of course people come to you for their personal grooming and of course personality development as yes. well but in Pakistan when we talk about of course you know teaching our children teachers as well for that matter so as to work on their personal styling so as to work on their personality development how you know aware is the average Pakistani regarding this concept you're going to be amazed uh, I am uh, working on this uh, under dress for success from KP to all the way to Karachi mm. and people are glued to their chairs I mean regardless of where they come from they could be faculty members they could be students they could be yeah. uh, business executives and all that the reason being this that the information which is very very important is not being disseminated to the mm. public right um, I'm, uh, fashion schools are doing a great mm. job I'm not gonna take any uh, you know thing away from them but here's the here's the thing for average man mm. or average woman they want to know uh, not so much about fashion but what looks good on them right mm -hmm. And so it is, of course, you can't, I don't think you can differentiate that because I think looking good is, of course, also part of fashion at the end of the day. Fashion is how you express yourself. Well, I would say this, that, uh, you know, um, a person, uh, you know, um, like I said, you know, let me differentiate between fashion and then what I represent. Hmm. Uh, I think fashion is very, very important. I think everybody should know what fashion is mm. and what, what, what's happening and what the trends are. Mm. Um, but I believe that everybody should look updated. Of they course. should look modern. They mm. should look contemporary. Right. Just to give you an example, right. I have gone from KP to Karachi yeah. all the way, and I asked only one question. Why are you wearing this color shirt, whatever right. color they're wearing? Mm. You know something? They all tell me only one answer. I liked it and I wore it. Right. I said, what do you mean? We are talking about education and of course, I think the focus of today's discussion is about students and teachers per se. Right. Do you not feel, of course, having had that benefit of working in the States and now, of course, in Pakistan mm -hmm. as well, having worked with so many professionals from different walks of life, that it is equally important to, you know, actually inculcate these personal grooming skills, not only in our students, but in our teachers as well? Absolutely. I'm doing, uh, uh, you know, for example, I'm the first one who started uh, working with HEC, mm. Higher Education Commission, and we did... Uh, I think probably 10 or 15 training sessions uh, mm -hmm. under their leadership, under their vision. Right, so your point is noted. On which, sir, I'll come to you. I think we must, of course, also talk about, you know, the challenges that people face both in the public sector as well as in the private education sector. And I understand the fact that, you know, you've had that benefit of working in both the sectors. So how do you, as a senior educationist, you know, compare and contrast the challenges that, of course, people do uh, undergo in both the sectors? Because private sector and public sector basic objectives are the same, hmm. to produce one of the best human resources for this country, not only for this country, for the world as well, right. because our, our our all the product is now is global, mm. and uh, equally very demanded in all, all walks of life. Mm. So, in public sector, the basically mm, the source of funding comes from the public, 
government sector hmm. and uh, they deliver their best hmm. but in public in private sector they are basically in an entrepreneurial way hmm. they are generating their all the resources with his own efforts and of course uh, so right. there is a lot of pressure on the private sector right. to sustain their sustainability over there right when we talk about improving of course the quality of the education i think the private sector here has a very important rather very leading role to play because i think this is something which has been of course you know prioritized not now but in fact time and again that there needs to be a public private partnership if we are to actually improve the quality of the education per se yeah. madam coming towards you i think we must also of course talk about teacher development more so holistic teacher development now we have seen that in pakistan over a period of time there has been you know tremendous focus being placed on of course you know having the right teacher for the right job and not only that not only getting them in but of course you know maintaining them as well mm -hmm. so of course as a teacher and you know speaking from your own real life narrative why do you feel that it is so important for us to work on you know teacher development and of course when we work on it how can we actually ensure that this is something which will actually you know have that effect of improving the quality of the education um so to start off with the public pri private sector mm. i think the differentiating factor does mm. remain the quality of the faculty mm. and how updated the co the faculty is not just with the academic side mm. because now we are looking beyond academia we are trying to make students relevant to the current industry that right. they will step into mm. so um Uh, the private institutes are very heavily invested in teacher trainings mm. or giving them research opportunities mm. so that they should be able to dig in deeper into real life uh, problems parallel to that private universities are also very actively engaging with the industry right tweaking curriculums mm. to make sure that they are be uh, everything is being reviewed revised more updated as to the current need and current demand right But i think the whole focus is now more on of course skill based education person mm -hmm. and that is something yeah. that we see in teachers as well because i think this is something which wasn't there before because previously it was just about you know having a certain kind of an academic record and just you know sticking by that mm -hmm. now see uh, academics the job of an academic mm. is primarily to research mm. and then teach Hmm. now that scope is widening because the demand of the market is to have students who have more relevant current everyday hmm. industry knowledge hmm. so to to ensure that the curriculum is connected with hmm. the problems of the industry hmm. the faculty that steps out to do consultancies hmm. with mainstream industry players they bring back so much more into the classroom right. their experience is is more 360 of course, versus more holistic absolutely mm. so i think that these are some some parallels to draw between right. private public and how and we can course. you know groom our teachers to be performing better in the class right i think that should be the main objective whether it's of course the public sector or the private sector because at the end of the day we are talking about the education mm -hmm. system and the country at large mm -hmm. per se mm -hmm. so coming towards yeah. you i think we must also of course talk about i understand that you know this is very important that you know working on one's personality development and of course uh, working on one's uh, you know personal grooming per se that too of course at a primary level in schools but what do you feel should Should be that age when children are taught because a lot of times we do see this criticism coming from parents, more so parents of girls that you know they don't feel very comfortable, you know, with the girls and mm -hmm. you know at a very young age being right. taught too much about beautification because you know it kind of distracts them from their studies. Right, you know, I'm not uh, so much about beautification because mm. I don't uh, represent that. Mm. It's the inner beauty of a person that's number one thing. and you know i have dressed more than 50000 men and women in my lifetime and i have not seen one ugly person in my life because i think that we are trained to look in uh, or we we accustomed to look in only the features and this and that whole bit but the world i think is much much deeper than that mm. and uh, you know it's it's like the holistic look it's about you know what looks good on you how you can look authentic how you can look uh honestly who you are and all that right. and within that framework you know it has color has a lot to do with hmm. with it like for example we have a specific coloration hmm. you know our, our coloration is much different than the coloration from white people hmm. and for that black people you know we we have specific coloration of course. so i have developed a, a formula which is called the five pieces of dressing i mean hmm. I, if i'll get a chance to explain that hmm. but briefly speaking to look good uh, you have to have these five pillars 
the color must be look good on you based on your eye color, hair color, skin tone. Mm. And then the style has to look good on your body type, whatever you are. You could be short, you could be tall, you could be heavy. Mm. It's not that whatever is in fashion that could work on work with you. And the third is uh, your personality. You know, what mm. kind of personality do you have? You could have a very flamboyant personality. Mm. Then you could uh, experiment with more style, more yeah. uh, kind of a little bit loud and all right. that. You can carry it. Right. The bottom line is this, that uh, man or woman does not carry the clothing, clothing. I mean, clothing does not carry the man or woman. Man or woman carries the clothing. Right. So. And then comes the uh, the position, like mm. you know, okay, so whatever you are in hierarchy of whatever you are, mm. you are working someplace. So, sir, I think in continuation to what you said, then of course, uh, would you be kind enough to tell us that when we talk about having that ideal student dress code, or for that matter, the ideal student teacher dress code, what should it be? Because at the end of the day, I think these things are also very subjective, and then of course, a lot of I think social cultural factors those actually come in play as well. I will talk more about images first, and then we could talk about if we have time, we'll talk about actual dresses. So let's talk about faculty. I would say the faculty must have four things in them in terms of their dressing. Mm. Number one, they must show authority, and obviously. Obviously, they cannot say, I have authority. Nobody's going to believe that, mm -hmm. you know. And you can't write, uh, you know, have a, have a billboard here that you have authority. So how are you going to communicate authority? It's going to be against, but, uh, from your uh, personal appearance and, right. you know, your attire, your personality, your persona, and the whole package. Mm -hmm. The second thing that I would say faculty members must, must uh, uh, I would say, uh, communicate is uh, approachability. Mm -hmm. Because it's not about, about all authority. It's not a bossy type of thing, you know. Of course. Because you got to talk to the students and they, you know, they need to be open with them and they can mm -hmm. talk to you. So the, the other thing is approachability. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is discipline, you know. So how could you administer discipline if you haven't administered discipline on yourself? You look very messy, you look mm -hmm. very disheveled, you look like, you know, coated and ran and of that course. sort of thing. So, and then the, the final thing is, uh, which is the most important thing, that you are a role model. So mm -hmm. you have to communicate that you are a role model. Right. So based on these four things, I would say, okay, so if, if, uh, if somebody's a lecture professor, they should look in the mirror and say, okay, does my dress mm -hmm. represent authority? Right. Does my And so my this, I presume, is regardless of age because we have people who are young, who are basically teachers, and then we have people who in the middle age are for teaching, and then of course we have elderly professors as right. well, on which, sir, I'll come to you. I think we must also, of course, talk about the access to education, more so when it comes to the rural areas of the country, because I think it's only fair that we talk about education in all contexts. So, sir, when we talk about, you know, rural education, and of course, improving access of people to rural education at the end of the day, we understand the fact that, of course, you know, the number of secondary schools there is, you know, much lower than that of primary schools. So, how at the end of the day, can we not only improve, of course, people's access to education there, but also ensure that, you know, they have a good quality of education that too, of course, at, you know, uh, an affordable uh, price. Our government is believe in SDG, Sustainable mm. Development Goal mm. 4. Mm. Mm, development Goal 4 means to provide quality education to every person, every particularly in children mm. education. So, we are focusing on our children education, but unfortunately, mm. in last decade, we could not attract the school children to that particular area. Right. Because we have lot of population, mm. and our poverty rate is very in a bad right. shape. And so, so I think after so, the floods, that has gone uh, yes, increased this, this is considerably, the flood and other calamities. Right. And we hit so even after COVID nineteen, COVID nineteen, mm. we are we are basically passing through these calamities. Mm. First COVID, then this flood. Mm. So uh, our school system badly damaged, mm. and particularly in KP, mm. in Sin, and some areas of our Balochistan and right, Punjab sir. as well. Mm. And uh, uh, in in this flood, mm. more than sixteen hundred people have been died hmm. and out of that 25 percent our children hmm. basically that is a great loss to our nation hmm. and despite all these things we have the population 220 million people right sir. but you are surprised to know we have the literacy rate around 50 percent hmm. and 50 percent are illiterate hmm. so our million of people are illiterate and our 220 million we uh, school children cannot touch the school. Right, sir. But I think in continuation to what you said, I think we must also, of course, you know, keep 
our discussion based on the improving the quality per se when we talk about of course giving children quality education now we understand the fact that of course article 25a of the pakistani constitution very categorically says that you know it is the responsibility of the state to provide free and compulsory education to any student or any child for that matter age between 5 to 16 years of age but when we talk about quality education how precisely do you feel can that be ensured more so when it comes to the rural areas of the country quality education mean we should have provide very good infrastructure of right, schools sir. as well mm. but unfortunately our school structure is very very weak and in a very poor condition as well mm. most of the school in rural area they don't have even toilets as well mm. they don't have the school residences as well right. and they have they have lack of lot of furniture as well mm. they they basically they sit on the earth and they are getting their education as well right so your point is noted on which i'll come to you madam i think we must of course talk about this whole discussion from the viewpoint of parents as well because we often see that you know uh, there can possibly be a clash between the parents and teachers especially when you know parents they tend to be very over involved in of course the way education is being imparted to the student per se so as of course you know a teacher in your own right and then of course as a parent yourself how do you feel can we ensure that you know both parents and teachers they have a smooth relationship because at the end of the day this is something which will then of course you know impact the child's education at the end of the day so i think parents and teachers have a common goal hmm. the only difference comes in the strategy and the route to achieve that goal hmm. so as a parent i feel that in at at the primary level we are putting too much pressure on the students hmm. and some very young children where the mind is not yet developed or receptive enough to take on the pressure that we are putting on that right. child <clears throat> having said that as an adult Hmm. in a university i do feel a certain amount of pressure does very well for students hmm. because it makes them stronger to face the much more competitive world that um, they are about to enter hmm. so um i think that rather than at the university level parents involve or engage themselves at a point where they say you know le lessen the pressure soften it down hmm. i would let the faculty take the lead on right. it because they are so much more aware of the external uh, uh, environment and the mm. rising uh, sort of standards mm. outside so i think that um, there has to be a point where the parents i think madam there has to be a right balance at the end of the day because you of course can't completely ignore the role of the parents to whom the child comes back to and then of course you can't let schools do what they have to do at the end of the day because otherwise why would you I be would, sending your child to an uh, school i would really to add that you know the pressure is a lot Hmm. Uh, but if we sort of holistically focus more on uh, more sports hmm. more um, healthy activities hmm. for students hmm. i think that that is a uh, is a fast way of getting out of the pressure hmm. and i think a lot of universities have great campuses right. that i think there must be an ideal balance between of course the contours for the parents as hmm. it does exist and of course between the duties of the school and teachers that regard because at the end of the day i think both are well wishers of the child but hmm. of course everything needs to be very neatly laid down hmm. so there's no conflict hmm. of interest hmm. on which sir i'll come to you i think we must of course talk about you know this criticism that was raised some time back which actually complained about the fact that you know when there were some guidelines being laid down regarding the dressing code of both the teachers as well as the students this is something which was of course you know fundamentally against people's you know rights because at the end of the day it's anybody's right to dress up the way that they want to dress up so looking at it from that argument from a humanist perspective how then do you feel can we strike a balance between of course not violating somebody's fundamental right the way they want to dress up and of course ensuring that they do dress up in an appropriate right. manner I don't really believe in very strict dress code. I mean, this is my has been my position for a lot of years mm. because you know we are not uniform people. So you know, I think I think uh, there is a lot of creativity which could be get killed in that way. Mm. But I'm more talking about professionalism. You know, people mm. should know who they are, what their roles are in the society, and everything. Mm. So students should know that she, she or he is a student. You know, right? And uh, in that role, you know, if they come in, uh, you know, there's a there's a herd mentality here in Pakistan, mm. and I think all over the world. You know, yeah. if everybody's wearing a jean, there everybody's going to wear jeans and t-shirt and all that. And but then uh, I don't have issue with that. But you know, how jean is worn, how it fits, how the how the t-shirt fits. and then i see a lot of motif here a lot of things written here which mm. doesn't even make any sense uh, i think the biggest problem here is that 
our students are not being groomed while they should be groomed. Because right. I, I, I get to the, to, the, to the last part of this is this, that students, when they graduate, they call me and they say, I have an interview. Mm -hmm. uh, how should I dress? What should I? I think they should be prepared for it right, already. So grooming, uh, like you asked this question uh, much earlier, grooming must start very, very early right. on. At the primary school level. At the primary school, right. and, and the parents must take uh, in, in a lot of interest in that. Of course. And, uh, and I think they should be dress codes at least to a minimalistic standard. They should be set down and over and above that, of course, and you know, people can have customized those. Madam, what would your perspective be on, on this? Because I understand that you're a fashion designer yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. So how can both the angles gel in together? Uh, so I would like to so say that the dilution hmm. is coming from the social media and I think dress codes are something that should be implemented subconsciously at a younger level mm. when when you when as parents we are raising our children mm. so when suddenly if a child uh, I've taught in girl, all girls schools mm. this is a very important dialogue right. when we have um, raised our child wearing jeans till she's still in her O levels one day we tell her sorry you cannot so mm. the cultural part of this I mean I recognize the constitution says mm. that everyone has a right to mm. the um, to, right. to how they dress but unfortunately that's so not that is the why I put this question to him that of course we have to exercise that right in of course keeping in mind the social cultural so context it's, it's, it's so dressing has to be very relevant to the situation right. Right. Exactly. Mm. so uh, situational recognition for students mm. is very very important mm. these this is a, a hot topic with all schools right as to how to address because something that may look very nice on a uh, on a on a slender figure mm. may not work the same thing the same t-shirt right. will not work on someone Absolutely. who's a plus size totally these agree. are considerations that we have to take because it becomes so difficult for mm. a faculty member to uh, to sort of point out one person and say you look fine but you don't right. the other so uh, this does come from home it should be integrated at a very young age mm. and this needs to not be integrated just in women in men as well uh, in men of course. Uh, the way our religion says how to view women right madam and i think at the end of the day is something which you also said earlier mm -hmm. i think there are two ends of the spectrum one is of course you just implement the dress code in its entirety the other is that you let them lose so we have to have mm -hmm. that mediocre approach but sir coming towards you i think we must also of course talk about in this regard a very important thing which is of course you know the access of girls education and we understand the fact that you know that the barriers to girls education they are also very high so when it comes to ensuring a girl child's education access uh, what do you feel needs to be done in this regard both of course at a policy level and of course you know in that regard at an institutional level according to our constitution of mm. Pakistan mm. the education is for every person in Pakistan, right, sir. whether it is girl or a boy mm. so there should not be barrier mm. in all walks of life mm. whether it is a rural area urban area or even our tribal area as mm. well so girls should be encouraged hmm. and uh, a few years back uh, KP government encouraged the girl education they right. incent they basically offer some incentives some stipends to, some, some type of incentives to come to school and hmm. their whole education will be free your books will be free hmm. and and also they offer some stipends as well right to, to encourage hmm. that level that should be very good uh, opportunity for, right. for those person. And it is the message to West as well. Hmm. We, our country, our religion is not a barrier of course to the not. girls' right. education. Right. So another thing is that the dress code, hmm. basically dress code, so we define and you for this is the teaching basically hmm. to discipline yourself. Hmm. This is not a, a, a any. A imposition right. of uh, some mm, from institution level or from home hmm. side. This is basically part of their discipline. Right. How to discipline yourself and this is basically preparation for the future. I think that's very rightly put by yourself that when we talk about discipline, of course, that is one of the fundamentals that we do need to teach our children at the end of the day, amongst, of course, other things. But Madam, of course, being the only female panelist today on the panel, you your narrative on this is extremely important too when we talk about addressing barriers to, you know, a girl child's education. In this regard, I again feel that, you know, the role of parents again is very fundamental. You can have laws 
to ensure that you know of course that a girl gets her education like any other boy but at the end of the day if she is living in a household where the parents are not very comfortable feeling you know sending the girl child off to school she of course her rights to a seek an education that in itself gets hampered so how do you feel looking at this from a socio cultural narrative can we actually you know overcome those stereotypes which hinder girls education more so from the parents perspective so i think that these are really macro level Uh, hmm. issues hmm. where um, let's take uh, hunza for instance hmm. highest level of education hmm. beyond gender hmm. so what we're trying to say is that these barriers we have to educate the parents right uh, a, an educated mother will always educate the child hmm. but it is collectively men and women coming mm. together understanding the value of education right. and there are parts of the country where i personally go and work where mm. men are um, respectful mm. and they they aspire for and these are very poor parts of sindh mm. where a lot of work has been done on gender mm. that results in uh, equal opportunity yeah. having said that i think that a lot of institutions are now uh, incentivizing um, subsidized um, tuition fees for women right madam your point is noted on which i'll come to you so i think we must of course talk about this whole discussion in the context of of course ensuring you know um, inclusivity with regards to education pers and in that regard i think a very relevant question for you then would be that when we talk about of course uh, working on the need to improve one's you know personal grooming of that matter personality development why do you feel is it more important you know that we equally work on of course you know the personality aspect on the personal styling aspect of you know children who are differently abled as well because at least from an objective bystander view point i feel that you know psychologically it might perhaps help them more uh, actually i totally believe in this you know uh, i'm the first one here in pakistan that who has done actually conducted a fashion show for mm. uh, uh physically challenged and special children right i have worked with the special olympics in in the united states of america mm. so i had this great idea i said you know their fashion uh, with all due respect to all the fashion shows here right. in pakistan uh, traditional fashion shows why it should not be a fashion show for special children mm. and we arranged with the uh, with the help of uh, uh, international uh, you know the special olympics and all that we conducted a, uh, a fashion show we had all fashion all, all uh, uh, models were uh, special children and i tell you something it was a great great experience because you talk about their self esteem you talk about they they should be loved and it was just amazing uh, uh, thing that we saw and, uh, and some of them i brought them on tv shows and uh, you know they expressed that how 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 good they felt and all right. this so that is definitely a neglected area i think and, and I think this is something that we must talk about at the end of the day because i think these are th- those unfortunate quarters of the society which are you know conveniently ignored which of course must not be the case but sir coming towards you and of course to conclude today's show so what would your uh, proposals be with regards to summing up today's discussion on the much needed educational reform that we do you know actually should ideally strive for in the pakistani society be it in terms of of course you know perhaps improving our education policies or for that matter you know better implementation of article 25a or for that matter just you know increasing mass awareness uh, of you know people and more so parents so as to ensure that you know their children do go to schools as we discussed earlier that we have there are three different tiers in the education of pakistan right, one is the school education that is other is the college education and the higher education the university level as well mm-hmm. but there is a lot of difference between all these three tiers mm. there is no connectivity there is no building blocks as well mm. so we should basically streamline all the curriculum as our school curriculum that should be linked with the college curriculum the right. college curriculum should be linked with the education curriculum mm-hmm. and the government should bring triple helix approach into that system triple mm. helix mean we should emphasize on academia industry mm. and public sector they should be joined together everything should together. be integrated that sh- those should be joined together right they should come together they mm. should work together they should move together to bring pakistan prosperous and one of the best in the world that's very This rightly is, put yes. by yourself because everybody is on the same page all the stakeholders yes that is very very very, very important there needs to be coordinated response in this yes. regard yeah. madam coming towards you and of course to you know wrap up today so i think we must of course talk about you know the ideal qualities that any teacher in your opinion mm. needs to have because of course we understand that you are a very accomplished teacher in your own right as well so what do you feel is it most important for teachers to work upon so as to you know i'm not 
only be impactful but also to be relevant in today's day and age? Uh, so, um, it has been proven that not necessarily the highest accomplished researchers would be the best teachers. Mm. So, classroom is more of a theatric. So, the, mm. what it is bottom line that we talk about as a teacher, what you, what is instrumental is your ability to communicate right. and to be able to um, give concepts from mm. from your experience into the students uh, so that they can pick it up and they can uh, maximize the utility of that. So right. um, knowledge is a given that teachers must have superior knowledge. They must upgrade their um, not only their knowledge, but their teaching style also. Very rightly put. Because uh, teachers who are effective are those who have a very, very unique teaching style. Right. And they, may, they leave a mark on the... Uh, of course. And it needs the, to be flexible in that regard too. I think something which uh, Sir yeah. earlier also mentioned that when we talk about, of course, inclusivity, it should be a style which should cater to all segments of the society. Right. Whether it's somebody who is an uh, able-bodied person or for that matter, somebody who is, you know, differently able. But Sir, to conclude the show with you, I think we must, of course, talk about the need not only, of course, to ensure that, you know, a personal grooming, personality development is something which should ideally be worked upon at, of course, a primary level, but it is also something Something which should be, of course, we worked on at a secondary level, at a higher education level, and then, of course, in the context of the professional life, uh, more so. So, for all the people who are watching the show out today, what advice would you give to individuals, especially those who are actually going uh, to give, you know, a potential job interview? That what are the do's and what are the don'ts of dressing up? Well, I would say first of all, when you are going for job interview, mm. uh, dress up for the uh, two positions above, or at least one position above, because the, mm. you want to be seen as like you can be promoted and this and that. They are valuable addition to the company. Mm. The other thing I would say is that uh, go on the internet, go on their Facebook, you know, find out what culture they have, how people dress up there, and uh, more importantly, what the higher ups, you know, the, how the mm. top management is uh, dressed up. Uh, but the tips I would give them is like, okay. I would say that uh, do not look at who's going to interview you. They might be in t-shirt on, on, and jeans and don't look like, you know, say that I'm going to just look like them. Mm. I think you should show respect. Right. And the way to show respect is if you're a man or woman, I would say wearing a jacket is is must. You know, right. if you go in a t-shirt or if you go in a shirt You look or too casual. Nobody you takes you seriously at the end Absolutely. of the day. Right. And then what color should be, I would say go for dark navy. Don't go for black. Mm. Black is a power color and you don't want to overpower them. You know, <laughs> you, you don't want to say that you have come there to overtake the company. Right. Uh, you're there to get the job. So I would not go for black. I would go for dark navy. Mm. Dark navy has three things. Uh, number one, that resonates with all socioeconomic level people. Mm. The second is it has authority and it has also approachability. Right. And the third thing that you can get a lot of mileage out of it because you can go for lots of interviews. Just change the shirt and a tie if you want to give it. Uh, and the best would be for uh, for a man, I would say white shirt. Right. White shirt, which it means trustworthy, it means credible, it means uh, mm. pure, honest. And as for the girls are concerned, they could take, uh, if they wear hijab, they could take white hijab or they could do some piping mm. and then that. So basically white is very, very critical. Shoes must be right. right. You know, you, you know, polished shoes. I've seen like terrible, terrible things, you know. People say, oh, I came on a bike and this and that and dusty this. And that. There's no excuse for not having polished shoes. You know, right. it's when it costs only about 100 rupees for a shiner. And then I think it should be well coordinated. You right. know, the outfit should be. Everything should look balanced and it should look like you're the same person at the end of the day because I think sometimes what we do is often I think younger people more so because of course they don't have that much experience or exposure that you know the clothes are of one color the shoes are of one <laughs> color then the accessories the jewelry that is completely different right. so I think everything at the end of the day needs to be very well coordinated absolutely ties are very important you know some people wear statement ties I would say stay away from them I mean you know what statement you want to make you want to you know tell people your value proposition right. so power ties are the ones you're going to wear don't wear too wide, don't wear too skinny. And if you wear a very tiny tie, you know, very small, skinny tie, it looks like a very boyish tie. Right. So you should know where this is. I think every should in. be everything should at the end of the day be in proportion and you should just look like yourself. On which note I would like to conclude today's right. show. Thank you so much, Abid thank Saab. You. Thank you so much, Madam Sahar, and thank you so much, Hamid Saab, for being here with us today. Well, to conclude today's show, we generally spoke about, you know, the education system as it does exist in the Pakistani society today. We of course also spoke about the very imminent 
imminent need for reform, highlighting the areas that do need to be worked upon. In this regard, it's very important to understand and of course, you know, reflect upon the fact that when we talk about education, education per se should just not be something which actually helps you advance your career. Education should also be something which actually empowers you, it enlightens you and of course, in the broader perspective, it also prepares you to actually deal with the challenges in life. That's it for today. Until next time, take care and Allah Hafiz.